Perfect. So our next speaker is Christina Delisle talking about GDPR. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm just going to try and look at the screen because uh, my computer failed me. Just don't look. I'm very proud of its brand, so it's, it's okay. Um, so I'm Christina. Thank you very much for choosing to attend this presentation. Uh, I'm very excited to be the one that is going to do the GDPR talk inside this room, and I'm going to talk about a few things related to open source and the quest for GDPR compliance. Okay, a few words about me at Xwiki. I am the Xwiki of uh, I am the <laughs> DPO of Xwiki SIS, which is a top sponsoring company of Xwiki, the open source project, which means basically that it has, according to its rules of governance, the most numerous number of developers inside the Xwiki dev core team. Regarding CreepBad, this is the result of work of our research team, and it's also an open source project. And uh, it consists of uh, encrypted editors which are stored inside the cloud. And it's in terms of the GDPR, it's encryption by design. And our uh, privacy compliance journey is something related to the communities formed around these two projects. And this talk is going to be about how the GDPR impacted the open source communities and second of all, how the open source communities can impact the GDPR and the principles of the GDPR, because the open source communities have principles and also have very healthy practices that can help and enhance the principles that the GDPR is talking about. Now let's see what the GDPR did to us. Uh, it has a lot of transversal impacts, and it was, to be honest, a very it was very challenging for me to do a slide about like an overall thing of how GDPR compliance uh, might, might work. And I just split it in like three, three main areas. Now, one impact was from the point of view of the legal and compliance governance. Basically, all companies, all businesses, all organizations had to uh, review their privacy strategies, taking into consideration the fact that there is a major risk of non-compliance. So basically, when, when a company is doing budgeting, it should take into consideration the fact that maybe, maybe there, there is a, a high risk of, uh, of non-compliance, so the budget should, uh, should, uh, should uh, take into consideration also these aspects. Regarding accountability, it changed basically the burden of proof, because so far, if somebody were to say something, the company was the one who was, was going to, to say, oh, I'm innocent. But now the company should be proactive and should prove its, its, uh, its compliance with the GDPR. And this means like a set of a lot of, a lot of things that, uh, that a, a business should do. Re regarding lawfulness, this is the part uh, about uh, the consent of the person, and the consent needs to respect a few rules that the GDPR imposes. About policy making, this was like reviewing all the policies that we have, respecting a few standards, that, respecting a few guidelines from, from the GDPR, and also a lot of auditing. So basically, auditing as, as our weapon, we audit something, and then we propose measures, and then we improve things inside the organization. So organizations had to think a lot, starting with 25th of May, last year. From the point of view of the technical aspect, what the GDPR does is has, is, is, is enhances a lot of things to do regarding handling data breaches. And also, it proposes encryption solutions to be a best practice inside the organization. So basically, encryption became like the rule that we need to take into consideration. We need to think about anonymizing data. We need to think about encrypting data. We need to think about this choice as primary between the choice of encrypting and not encrypting, we should go on the part of encryption. Uh, and also privacy by design and by default, and it made a lot of difference also from the point of view of data collection and life cycle, because now the data should, uh, should uh, take into consideration, now the data should uh, should be collected also for specific purposes and should be kept also as long as those purposes exist. And also, it should not be extended, it, it should not be used more than it should be, and so on. I'm sure that you received a lot of, you are very informed from this point of view about what these things mean. These are a few of the areas of the biggest fines that were applied so far. 
uh, and a lot of them um, take, into, take into consideration things that have happened before the GDPR got enforced. And we can see that one of the main things is rela related to consent, and this is like what the marketing team inside an organization did. And uh, when the consent was, for example, not freely given, or when the consent was like, instead of uh, yes and no, the options was yes uh, or yes, or something like that. Or uh, when, I don't know, sending an email to, uh, to, uh, to the data subject and adding in CC all the other people from our mailing list. I mean, these are things that basically have happened and have uh, on the other side have brought uh, a lot of fines to the people doing them because they did not consider the, the, the lawful way of treating consent. Uh, regarding data security areas, uh, there have been a lot of leaks, breaches. Uh, the InfoSec area has been on, around the block for a long time, so they, it's not something really new for them. Uh, and regarding, uh, regarding uh, those, two, uh, those two things that I placed there, you can see there some causes of why, um, of why breaches happen. And also you can see some effects of what happens when a breach is, is happening. Basically, if we are talking about a small business, pretty much 60% of small businesses close their doors before the GDPR. This is actually a statistic that happened in 2014. Now let's see what the GDPR did very fundamental. It reflects, it, uh, it, it was impacted from the point of view of the relationship between the data controller and the data processor. Basically, a data controller is the one that is the company that determines the purpose and means of processes. And the processor is the one that is having a DPA with the controller, and is the third party that processes it on the controller's behalf. And in between themselves, we have currently this thing called DPA, Data Processing Agreement, and they are obliged basically to establish a few set of rules in between of them, taking into consideration different aspects regarding how they will handle data breaches. If for example, a data processor has a data breach, it should inform the data controller. There are, there are like lots, lots, of, lots of things that the GDPR imposes that pretty much previously were not very enforced and were not very clear. So basically the GDPR did a very cool thing in determining what are the relationships between the controller and the processor and also take into consideration also the fact that somebody can act as a controller and a processor on, a, on the same relationship depending on the data that, um, that we are talking about. So you can be a controller and also a processor at the, at the same time basically depending on the data that you are handling inside your organization. Uh, and also, the processor can have subprocessors, and the relationship pretty much stays the same. And if you think that this distinction between controllers and processors is pretty much something new, in fact, it existed previously. And a very revolutionizing thing that happened around 2012 was when Google INC was sued and at that point, there was, this, um, there was a decision that was brought by the European Court of Justice on Google Spain and Google Incorporated, Incorporated versus Mr. Gonzalez, who was a Spanish citizen. So this, this decision at that point was a ve very revolutionizing because up to that point, Google was considering itself a data processor. And after this decision, because the European Court of Justice made this, uh, this, this ruling, uh, Google was considered a data controller, which meant basically a lot of extra work of them to do, and this was even before the GDPR. And the impact of this was that by 2016, Google received a lot, a lot of requests to remove approximately 1.2 million websites, which previously were not at their door, or which previously existed at their door, but they would would have had the opportunity of just saying, I'm a processor, go to the controller. And now we pretty much know Google is a controller. So we do have the opportunity of making a lot of requests, for example, because it's our data. And they should answer to, uh, to those requests, of course. 
Now let's see how we are imposing this model, the model between data processor and data controller, to the open source model. Because it's a bit challenging. It's not really the, the classical business report that we are having when we have a company and another company. We have a lot of controllers and processors around the open source communities, around the open source ecosystems. And we have also the community itself. The community is not something that is for profit. It's something that is that is formed by us, it's formed by data subjects, data subjects that are physical persons that pretty much have rights now, which are very enforced by the GDPR. And uh, I call the others, the controllers and processors, <laughs> the infrastructure providers. They are the ones who, let's say, they are buying our beer. But pretty much they are providing our hosting, if we have a forum or a website, for example, they, 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 they are offering us a lot of things around what we are doing inside our open source community. And now let's give uh, some examples of who's who. Who is a controller and who exactly is a processor? In Xwiki, the open source software, the controller of hosting on xwiki.org, which is where you will find the uh, open source project, is Xwiki SIS, which is the company that offers services on top of the, pro the open source project. And on behalf of the company, OVH, which is another company, uh, offers hosting. So basically, Xwiki SIS is a controller of that data from xwiki.org, which is the open source project, outsource, let's say it like that, to a processor, which is OVH. And we have basically this report between these three aspects. We have the community, we have Xwiki SIS, and we have also the OVH, which is the data processor. On GitHub, for example, that we all know very much, loves a lot uh, the open source software. Uh, GitHub acts as a controller of our personal data from our free private user accounts. So if we have an account on GitHub, which I pretty much know you do, GitHub, the company, is the one that is the controller of your email address, for example. And if you are, for example, a business like Xwiki SIS, for example, and you buy some things from them, some, some services, and uh, you want them to process the invoices, it, they become the processor of those invoices. So they, they act also as a controller on some aspects and as a processor on some other aspects. Now, why should they process our personal data? Because the GDPR offers us a few very clear reasons of why somebody can process the, the personal data that we give them to, that we offer them. First of all is compliance with the law, and this is basically a legal obligation. For example, invoices, we pretty much know now, depending on the legislation, there is a certain time that we need to keep those invoices. So basically, if somebody makes a request to delete an invoice from our database, we cannot do it because the law says we cannot, so we have to keep it. Now, the contract reasons. This is a contract that is done by the data subjects. For example, if you come to FASDEM and you uh, sign an agreement with the uh, conference organizers, you pretty much have a contract with them that you should come, you should pay, you should, you should be here, and so on and so forth. Legitimate interest is something very, very, interest, very, very interesting because it's always something about assessment. It's about balancing. It's about balancing the interest of the person who is a data controller and the interest of the data subject itself. Because for example, if you are a notorious person uh, and you have your, you have, there's an article in the newspaper about yourself, if you, uh, if you ha make a, a deletion request, maybe the newspaper can say no, but you're a public person. But if you're a private person, then the balance pretty much shifts. And uh, the GDPR talks about careful assessment. And the consent, which should be specific, informed, it should require an affirmative action, and it should be freely revocable. Basically, if I change my mind, uh, it should, uh, the, the data should be given back. Now let's see some illustrations. From the point of view of the contract, your username and email address are given in order to create your GitHub account. And also you are uh, 
pretty much accepting their terms of service agreement with the GitHub. This is the example of the conference the previous, uh, th that, that I previously explained. So we have the terms of service agreement with the company GitHub and we accept it. So basically we accept them to process our email address or our username. The consent is something related, for example, to my picture from xwiki.org, where it was something not necessary for that account to exist, but I just decided to offer them my picture. So they are processing my picture based on my consent. Legitimate interest, and this is interesting, the commits to the open source code of an open source project. In order to make that commit to the open source project, you need sometimes to provide your name, to provide your email. And you are pretty much aware of the fact that you are doing this, and your intention pretty much is to uh, make it public, is to contribute. So that, that processing is legitimate on behalf of the open source people that you are, con of the open source, uh, of the open source software that, that is processing your personal data. And for example, we have here the developer certificate of origin from Linux uh, that pretty much states what, uh, what the GDPR uh, has said, and this is a bit like older, including all personal information I submit with it, including my sign off. So when you contribute to the Linux open source project, you pretty much are aware of the fact that your email address will, maybe will always be public or that what you are committing will always be public and will not be deleted if you ha have a data subject request. Let's see, open source and the GDPR. The control of the downloaded, the, the control of the data is to the people. And this is what pretty much the open source did, the open source software did. As the GDPR has as main aim, as main spirit, to give the data back to the people. It doesn't belong to the controllers, it belongs to the data subjects. Cloud computing has been a very old debate around the open source uh, software community, and with this model of processor and controller, what the GDPR did was something good for the open source, because it pretty much cleared the relationship between the cloud provider and the people using that provider. The provider is a processor, and the, the person using it is offering that data in order for it to process. So basically, uh, so basically uh, it, it enhanced this report, it, it, it helped, it contributed to this debate on cloud computing. Regarding extraterritoriality, this is highly compatible with what, uh, with what the online environment uh, has because it's, it's like perfect. If we, the, the GDPR pretty much becomes like the new standard of the future regarding privacy and it extends borders. Even though it is in theory applicable to data subjects from the European Union, it pretty much in the future might become the standard. And pretty much people from outside Europe are considering the GDPR when they are doing their policies. The open source governance is by default transparent, and this is something that helps the GDPR because we can see the, we can see bugs, for example, and we can fix them. If there is a security issue, we can fix it. And everything is pretty much visible to everybody, and everybody can pretty much contribute to the success of the open source project. And also, it's, 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 this, this transparency contributes a lot to, um, to uh, help us prevent vulnerabilities of a code because people are participating and also it's very privacy oriented because it's for the people, by the people, and also it's facilitating meritocracy which pretty much speaks by itself. The open source innovation privacy is something that is not really a coincidence in my opinion because a lot of the open source projects nowadays are considering privacy as something very fundamental inside their, their, uh, their uh, principles inside their projects. We have decentralization, we have federation networks, we have zero-knowledge collaborative software, which is creep bad, and I wanted to illustrate to you how privacy by design and default are, um, are um, enhanced by zero-knowledge collaborative software, and by default, I mean zero-knowledge collaborative software basically using encryption pretty much speaks by itself regarding privacy by design, and the privacy by default thing, which means that 
you, an organization should only process data that is necessary to an extent that is necessary as long as it is necessary. And this is something actually debatable because if we store data in the cloud, should it be by default encrypted? This is more like something to, to debate because on the other hand, the cloud provider will not be able to provide backups. And this is something that it should be balanced. Like what, what should be the perspective of the future regarding, regarding cloud computing? It should be private by default to have it encrypted or it should be privacy by default to have the current status quo. Now, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much for attending this presentation again. And if you have any questions, please uh, do uh, ask. I think we have some time. Hello, thank you very much Hello. for the talk. Um, so you. my question is around the um, kind of legitimate interest without uh, somebody overseeing like a, either a regulator or somebody that, you know, legal department, etc. Uh, the temptation is to tip the legitimate interest ever in the favor of, you know, the companies or the data processor or the subprocessors. Um, do you think that that's currently one of the problems with the regulation, or will we get to that as you know more information about GDPR emerges? Okay, that, yeah, that's that's a good question. What I think is that it's something very healthy to debate first inside the organization if we should if if we should accept or not a data a, a data subject request, and it pretty much this debate contributes to uh, to the future of that of that data request. Pretty much to, to show you how this thing is working. You as a data subject, you are sending to the organization a, a, a data subject request. And the organization currently should like think first, should it accept your request or should it not accept your request? And I believe this is actually healthy in determining what is the positioning of that organization because pretty much what, what that organization is doing is not really ruling what is the, the, the right thing to do. That is the job of a judge that pretty much afterwards might come. And uh, what the organization does is have an answer to that request. And after, if you, let's say, you are not satisfied with that request, you can move forward and you can go to the national, uh, to, to the national authority and say why you are not satisfied with that request. And now we have another procedure where the national authority who are not the judges, are the ones who are deciding if that request should be okay, if you're right, or if you're wrong. And if you are not satisfied with that thing, you can go, as Mr. Gonzalez did, to a national court. He went to Spain first. He went to a national court from Spain. And afterwards, uh, he was not satisfied with what the national court of Spain did. And then he went even higher, and then even higher, it encountered a judge that had a question for the European Court of Justice. And the European Court of Justice, like it had pretty much like more questions, but one of the questions were, is Google incorporated uh, a controller or is it a processor? And the European Court of Justice said at that point before the GDPR that it is a controller. And this was, and this was an evolution towards the perspective of how we handle privacy. And I believe this is, this is healthy because, in general, in my opinion, it's very important to debate, and I am very, uh, I'm very pro that, uh, that attitude. Do you have any more questions? Sorry to steal. No, okay. Okay. This way we, we, we start. Okay, thank you very much. Hi. Hello. Just a quick question. Is she there? Is she going? I don't know whether she will hear me. Hello. No. Hi, just a quick question. Ah, okay, okay, um, yes. Regarding, so I'm a teacher, I'm an educator, not a software developer. 
Uh, yes. GDPR came into the UK for us as educators as quite a big thing and across the world for us to look at to conform to schools. Because uh, in reality I cannot really hear you. So yeah. Oh, right. Can you hear me now? Excuse me? Can you hear me? No. No. No, she can't hear me from here. So I, I, I can pointless. hear that you said she can't hear me. Oh, right, okay. Yep. So, um, yeah, we had GDPR come in for schools to use that we had to take quite seriously. But things like, and I won't name names, but some of the software that's been given to schools for free now has like 35 million users in the UK. We're opting into them knowing that they conform to GDPR, but then we're not looking when it goes to the legitimacy interests that those companies then share to 45 other companies under the basis of the information they collect about children in okay. schools to 45 other companies under the legislation of um, legitimate interests. You cannot, I have tried, you can't seem to see or get any further than that. They just stand there and go, it's legitimate interest that we take your kids' information from school and we farm it out to Google, to Amazon, to all of these other proprietary things. But educators aren't getting the message that the free software that they're getting sold at national conferences, like I spoke at, at BET, which billions of pounds were spent on to sell it to us, that this is an issue for their data privacy, for their students. We're effectively giving away young people's information and not even parents are, uh, are these kind of these kinds of things are getting through to them. GDPR, how do you feel that that has made a, a dent on it? Because I feel like it's just gone, yeah, we got legitimacy with GDPR, mm. but now we can just put legitimate interests and everybody will be fine about it. I don't, I don't think personally that legitimate interest is something that, uh, that is, uh, let's say, just posted and it's like, yeah, it's in legitimate interest, so but as a first defense from a company, you might hear the legitimate interest. So currently, we do have a gray area in that, in that, uh, in that aspect. So the, the answer might be in the evolution of the vision we have currently on the GDPR and on privacy. What I do believe, however, is that what we did so far is an evolution. So we can notice significantly that this is starting to become something important and something very relevant, something to be placed on the agenda. And this is something that, that, uh, that actually was seen on the 25th of May when everybody had like so different interpretations about what the GDPR does doesn't and so on and so forth however after the 25th of may last year things have pretty much gone in the direction of privacy now companies are thinking about it now and us as a data subjects what we should do and as members of open, of an open source community is is in fact be aware of the fact that we do have lots of rights and we do have the possibility of using them so if we use these rights, we are actually putting pressure on the private sector and we are putting pressure on, we, we, are, we are putting pressure on this evolution. We are contributing basically to, to them offering more attention towards this topic. So